Hi everybody, this is Matthew Pose of Pose Acoustics. All right, so Mark Lombardi, 5980, who has given a $15 donation and has asked many questions before, so thank you, Mark. He says, thanks, I have a follow-up that is not exactly on this topic. The topic was DIY subs, shelf filter, and PEQ, but somewhat related. If it's too specific for a general public answer, I understand. Why don't we see open baffle dipole subwoofers offered commercially? I just built two H-frames with three 12-inch servo drivers each and a servo plate amp. Although they are not made for the chest slam market. For music, they sound great. And for my needs, they work for HT as well, home theater. The advantage of modal cancellation really makes a huge difference in my room. With extension filters and Dirac, they are 3 dB down at 15 Hertz and distortion above 20 Hertz is under 2%. Well, you didn't say at what SPL level though, Mark. So the answer to your question is a couple things. One is, um, in general, those types of subwoofers are very inefficient at producing deep bass. So um, you've got the equivalent in this case, if you look at it, so I think you said you built two with three 12s in each. So two 12s is about an 18. You have six, so you have three 18 inch drivers. I'd like to see what the max SPL is at 20 Hertz before distortion rises too much. Does it equal what three sealed 18s does? The answer is almost definitely no. And that's the reason why you don't see them. Um, they're, they're just not efficient at producing those low frequencies. The other thing I'll just mention is that I'm guessing I know what servo system you're using. Technically, properly done servo systems need to account for all of the loop, basically, the signal loop. By definition, a dipole subwoofer system cannot be a true servo system because the only portion of the loop that's being accounted for then is the driver's behavior on its own. Um, by having an open enclosure. So basically the answer to this really would be servo subs can only be sealed subs. Any other type of sub is not a true servo sub. The loop feedback is incomplete. But there's this company that developed a system where they're doing ported subs and then others have developed uh, the ability to do things like the H-frame subs with them and call them servos. There is a servo and there is a feedback loop, but it's not a closed loop feedback loop. And so it's not a proper servo system. And there's articles and papers that have been written on this before. So what that means is that the ability to fully provide feedback and suppress distortion is um, not as complete as it should be. And that there becomes a certain point where the behavior of the driver isn't being properly accounted for by that servo and the distortion is gonna rise. There's also issues with servos in general, which is that it takes power to remove distortion. And so they too become in exceedingly inefficient as you get higher and higher in output. So I hope that basically answers the question. It's just an issue of efficiency. The other thing I mentioned is you said that they, um, here, how did you put it? The, the advantage of modal cancellation. So they can't cancel modes. They don't do that any better than any other subwoofer. They have different directivity. So um, I don't know if somebody else has used that term modal cancellation. Modal cancellation would be what Direct Art is doing and what um, waveforming is doing. They are canceling modes by removing the thing that causes it. Now, I don't love the term cancellation, but sometimes that's been used for um, uh, the approach that Todd Welty came up with. In that case, I don't really think it's canceling mode so much as you're just sort of creating so much, you're exciting so many of the modes that you don't have the same kind of peaks and dips that you would normally have. And as a result, where you would have had a peak from one source in one location and you have a dip from another, they kind of equal out. You're not canceling the mode, it's still there. You're just basically having, you're combining the, the um, excitation of those modes in a very high way. By definition, if you reduce directivity of a subwoofer, you're not actually exciting the modes more uniformly. What you're doing instead is quite opposite. You are not exciting the modes. So you're not canceling it, you're just not exciting it. However, for the vast majority of length modes and uh, width modes and even vertical modes, that change in directivity doesn't really change the excitation of modes that much. And there's been some studies in the form of simulations that have shown that there isn't a great difference once you get a bunch of subs in the room between different methods. Now, I think there is an advantage though to these types of subwoofers. Um, I do personally like a different approach than the H-frame for this, but basically whenever you create, so H-frames are typically cardioid radiators. And what that means is that there's radiation out the front, there's some radiation out the back, but it's reduced, and there's very little radiation out the sides. So one of the biggest problems we often have with speakers is SBIR, or speaker boundary interference response. These are not modes, and they behave differently than modes. They are caused by reflections around the speaker, 
where the sound, it doesn't actually have to be, you get SBIR from the back wall too, but the sound hits like the side wall, for instance, and then it comes back to reflection. And then it interferes with itself, basically. It interferes with the direct sound of the subwoofer and it causes peaks and dips. If you have significantly reduced energy to the sides, then those sidewall reflections are also reduced and those SBIR effects are reduced. Same with the back wall. Even though there is radiation out the back, there's usually re reduced radiation. And some cardioid systems are more heart-shaped like, meaning there's very little radiation out the back. And so you get this other benefit of, because that's often one of the strongest ones that causes it, the sound that hits the back of the room, back, not the back of the room, the front of the room that's behind the subwoofers for subs in the front. When that radiates back, there's so little energy that it doesn't, doesn't combine and cause those same peaks and dips. So I do think that there are benefits to cardioid radiation. I personally think the benefits typically are much higher in frequency. So I think their benefits would pr typically be more like 50 hertz on up. So I'm not, I don't really feel like true subwoofers need to operate in that range, but I do think that having base modules that operate in that range as your primary source with that kind of radiation can be beneficial. Um, now in my own room, I've taken a completely different approach and it has the same effect. There is no SBIR effect anymore and there is no modes and that's using waveforming. So there's different ways to do this. This is just one of them. But as I said, the reason why this isn't done is for the same reason why you don't see three 12 inch subwoofers very often. 312 subwoofers would be very big and heavy. They'd be expensive to ship. And the output that you get below 50 hertz from those subwoofers would be significantly worse than if you stuck the, took those same subwoofers and stuck them in a sealed box. And um, in general, the industry, when it's gonna sell products, wants to sell stuff that provides a lot of bang for the buck, which means a lot of output. Um, as I said, I, I don't have these to test if the company that makes these kits would like to send me a completed one for burst testing, we could put it through CTA 2010 testing and see how it does. But I would, be, I would guess that the performance would not match the driver count. It's the best way to put it, um, compared to other types of subwoofers we've tested. I have not tested one of these before like this. This is just my understanding from a theoretical standpoint of how they tend to work. Happy to be proven wrong, but like I said, I'd want to see proof. Like you're gonna, we're gonna have to test them properly. I'll also say before anyone says this, any suggestion that these would not perform properly without being in a room is not correct. So the burst testing on these would be just as fair as it would be for any other type of subwoofer because all subwoofers get benefit from the room. And in fact, specifically because these don't radiate as much to the sides and back, they're not gonna get as much gain either. So testing these subwoofers outdoors, ground plane, Doing burst testing and compression testing is just as fair of a test for these as it would be for anything else and would give an accurate assessment of their maximum output within the confines of the test itself. The tests are not perfect. All right, I hope that's good. Remember, like my videos, please. Subscribe to my channel. I got to get my subscriber, uh, subscriber count up there and uh, keep on watching. I got more coming. We're trying to get more videos out. We've just been behind. Thanks, guys.